And speaking of, today, my friend Andrew Midget is here, if you would like to come up. Um, Andrew is an uh, elder at one of our partner churches in eastern North Carolina in Moorhead City. Uh, and yeah, you'd be hard-pressed to find, um, in my opinion... Be careful what you say. <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm, getting a little, I'm getting a little emotional. Um, Andrew's just very fatherly, um, and I'm really grateful to have him in my life. Mm-hmm. And uh, I've asked Andrew um, before he preaches to kind of just pray a prayer of blessing uh, in way of intercession for our moms today. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. All vocations before God are holy, especially the vocation of being a mom. And so if you're a mom and you're taking care of kids, whether you stay at home with them or not, whether you have a career, if you're a mother, that's a holy calling and a holy vocation. And we want to bless that and honor that. And we also recognize that today is challenging. It's hard. I mentioned that earlier. There are those in the room that have lost children. There are those in the room that have lost moms. There are are those in the room who long to be moms but can't or aren't yet. Uh, and there are those in the room who maybe have a fractured relationship with your mom. Hmm. Uh, and we would say to every one of you, we see you, God sees you, yeah. and this is a safe place for you to feel those things. Hmm. And God is a safe place for you to bring those emotions. So we want to bless everyone I've just mentioned. And so can we join Andrew in praying for these yeah. moms? Yeah. Yeah, Father, we thank you <clears throat> for life. You know, your word says that you breathed into man life. Ex nihilo, you breathed into him and he became a living being. And so, Father, we thank you for life. We thank you for mothers. We thank you for, you know, how you have wired them, Father God, to be all in all in the family and to raise kids and to work and to do all those things. And we know, Father God, that there's hurt and there's pain and there's, there are issues that often come to bear, Father God. There's barrenness and there's pain between you know, parents and children. There's all those things, Lord God. But you are good and you have created life and you are a, a great father to us. And Lord God, we thank you for mothers. And we just thank you for what they do. We thank you for all that they do. And they are so important. As much as I'm a father in our, in our household, Father, my wife has been a great mother. And so we just thank you for, for how you do these things, Father God. You're such, all these things were because of you, because you created marriage, you created kids, and all those kind of things. I do pray, Lord God, for those who can't have children yet. And your word does not hide from this, Father God. It is in your word, the, the emotions of barrenness, Lord God. And so I just pray for those who are here this morning that have not had children yet, that, Father God, that you would see and move and act and uh, open their wombs, Father God, and just so we might rejoice in your grace to them. I do pray for broken relationships, for families who are just struggling right now, Lord God, that you would heal the brokenness of relationships. For those who, whose mothers have passed, that you would just give them great peace today. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus, your Son, and for his glory. Amen. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning. And... Um, I know I'm short, but I'm not that short. I had to move this thing up a little bit. I think they took midget literally this morning. (laughs) Uh, But I have really desired to be here, and I cannot express how much I have desired to do this. Uh, And it's not because I just like to to preach and hear my own voice. It's because I have great uh, um, affection for John, your, your lead pastor, and also Blake, they have been on my back porch, and I have watched them cry, and I have watched them laugh, and we have spent time together. And so my heart has been knit with this place ever since John came back. And I have prayed. I often pray. I said, Lord God, just grant me a chance to go preach one time. And so it didn't happen, and it didn't happen. And finally I said, well, dang, Lord. I mean, is, am I asking something wrong here? And, but then all of a sudden, this, this opportunity popped up, and I just am so thankful that God would do this, but allow me to come this morning. The saints of One Harbor greet you. We support this body in ways that you'll never know. We love you. If you don't know anything about me, know that we love you, that I love you. And I count it a great privilege to be here this morning. I also want to thank Danny Davis for letting me stay in his man cave last night. Um, I, in fact, I told him I want to stay in your man cave. Now, if I can just figure out how to get what's in his man cave in the back of my truck before I leave, <laughs> things will be good. It'll be a great weekend. So I'll be able to preach and take all Danny's stuff. 
But he is a very, just a very gracious friend, and he is such a giving man. And so I want to honor him for that because he has been very kind to me since we've met. He's just a good dude, and so I'm thankful for you, Danny, very much so. Uh, it's also just a great honor this morning to continue in your series out of John. You know, the book of John, Meeting the Real Jesus. And so this is kind of important for us. And you're, you're taking the book of John and you're, and you're seeing what Jesus looks like and how, how John presents him to us. But now before we go forward, I think it's important for us to look back. To look back at what you heard last week. Because the, the, you know, the book started last week, not this week. And there's some things that John says very powerfully in the first five verses of John. He starts with this, in the beginning was the Word. You know, Scripture starts in Genesis with, in the beginning, God. John says, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He is saying God, that Jesus is deity. He is God made flesh. He was in the beginning, so He is pre-existent. Jesus had no beginning. He has been the Son eternally. From the foundations of the world and beyond, Jesus has always been the eternal Son. All things were made through Him. So He is the Creator God. Jesus is the Creator. He made all things. In fact, He does say that there isn't one thing that's been made that wasn't made by Him. Now, as you know, a nation and people, we take materials and we make things. We make iPads. We make cars. We make all kind of stuff, boats. We do all these kind of things. But what we make those things out of are things that he's already put here. So he is the creator God. And then it ended with this last week. He was life and light, and darkness could not overcome him or could not overcome it. He was light. And so John, John starts this book making very strong declarations about who Jesus is. He says, Jesus is God. Now, it's, that's not how the world would view Jesus, right? I mean, it doesn't view him in quite that way. The world would say that he was probably just a good teacher. Uh, he, they may even go as far as saying he's a mighty prophet. A, a lot of the Muslim faith said they, they would recognize Jesus as being a mighty, mighty prophet. They don't see him as the Son of God. But they do put some sta standard to him. They say, okay, he is, you know, a mighty prophet indeed. Or maybe just even a good teacher. I mean, that is how the world takes Jesus, and they try to view him in those three ways. He's a good man, a mighty prophet, or just a good teacher. But there's no way, no way that he is God in flesh. And so there's a tension there. Uh, C.S. Lewis, speaking about this tension, says this about our, what we believe about Jesus. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon. Or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing uh, nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And so the idea that Jesus is just some great human teacher is not open to us. He is either God made flesh or he's not. And we are not left with a lot of, of choices about the identity of who Jesus is. And I think that's why John starts out the gospel, his gospel that way. He says Jesus is God. And that is great, just overflowing, great theology. And I love theology, and it just shows, I'm sure. I mean, he speaks of this, who God is. But then all of a sudden, he makes a slight detour. Now, my wife said detour. I said course change because I work on the water. I'm a harbor pilot by trade. And so when you go to Moorhead City, there's a small port there. And any ships that come in and out of the port, there's a 50-50 chance I'm on it. And I bring the ships in, and I, and I turn them around, and I dock them. I do all those things. That's what I do for a living. That's my job. And so a course change for me is two degrees, a little bit. Now, you can change the ship's course 
and not move it very much. But so John, on the back side of all this great and wonderful theology, makes a slight detour or a slight course change, and he introduces us to the one who is called the messenger or the witness, John the Baptist. So please open your Bibles this morning, and I guess it will be on the screen. Okay, the text will be on the screen if you don't have a Bible. And let's look at our text this morning and see what it says about John the Baptist. Sound good? Sound good to you? All right. All right, beginning in, ver- in chapter 1 of John, in verse 6, we'll go through verse 13. And this is John the Apostle speaking. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to be children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. I think it's safe to say that, that this introduction of this witness, this, this man that John is introducing very quickly this morning, raises some questions. Number one, why does he call him a witness? I mean, what, what was his you know, job as a witness? Why was he so important that John would bring him up right after all this theology, theology about Jesus, all of a sudden he brings up John the Baptist. Well, Jesus is so amazing that God sends someone to announce his coming. In the ancient Near East, you need to understand this, whenever a king would get ready to visit an area, he would always send somebody ahead of him. And he was to make the preparations for the king's arrival. And if there were any obstacles in the way, then he would take care of those things. And so there was always a messenger that would go before the king. And the the king would say, okay, I'm coming. You need to get ready. And so that's culturally how it, it ties into Christ's day. They would understand this. Why? Because they had kings and kings would come and go. And so they said, this would make sense to them. Culturally, this makes sense. But it also accomplishes something else. You know, Scripture always pointed to Jesus. When you start in Genesis chapter 1, it points to Jesus. When you get to the fall in Genesis 3, it's pointing to Jesus. All of Scripture points to Jesus. But wrapped up in this promise of the coming of Jesus was also the appearance of the witness. The one who would prepare the way of the Lord. Malachi, which is the last book in the Old Testament, says this in in chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant, covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And so at the end of, 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 of Malachi it talks about not only the coming one who is to come, which is Jesus, it talks about the one who is to prepare the way. And so in, a, in a one sense, what John is doing is saying, this has been fulfilled in John the Baptist. And so it does fulfill this covenant promise that God had made. The one is going to come. And so, and I'm sending my witness before him. Now, there was some disagreement as to who John the Baptist was. Some of the scribes thought that he would be Elijah. In the Old Testament, there was a prophet, mighty indeed, who was Elijah. He was one of two men in Scripture that never tasted death. Enoch was the first one in Genesis. Elijah is the second. And if you go to 2 Kings chapter 2, it will tell you the story about Elijah being taken up into heaven in a whirlwind, that God sent a chariot of fire down, and Elisha was beside him walking, and they're separated, and God takes Elijah up. And so that's kind of what, you know, the idea was that, okay, Elijah never dies, so Elijah's going to come back. But John is not a reincarnated Elijah. He is not a, another Elijah. He was a man who was empowered for a purpose. In Luke chapter 1, 
uh, 15 to 16, the angel of God is talking to John the Baptist's father. He's talking to John's father. And he says this about him. He, John, must not drink wine or drink. And he, must, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. So what made John and Elijah similar is that the Spirit of God rested on John, and it rested on him from the time that he was in his mother's womb. And that is why in the, in the Gospels it says that Mary comes bearing Jesus in her body, and she's pregnant with Jesus, and John's mother is there, and they come together, and as soon as Mary, uh, uh, Martha heard the voice of Mary, John leapt in her womb. Well, why is that? He, the Spirit of God was on him. He knew who was in his presence. And so the Spirit of God is resting on John. So John is a major character. I mean, he is very fascinating. And it can be easy to just key on John because there's a lot more said about him in the Gospels, and I will not cover it all, but he is a very fascinating individual. But just remember, all of this is pointing to one, and he is pointing to Jesus. And you know, he's the only one who would have us continue talking about Jesus and not about himself. He would never point to himself. John would never say, look at me. Look at me. I'm John. I am empowered. Look at me. He's always pointing to Jesus. Three verses I want to give you this morning. And these are how John spoke to the people concerning Jesus. This one who he's going before and preparing the way for. First of all, Mark 1-7 says this. And he preached. So John was a preacher. After me comes he who is mightier than I. The strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. And so John understood that Jesus, this one who is coming, is so mighty, so powerful, so glorious that he could not step down and take his sandals off his feet. He was that glorious. John 1.15, you'll probably hear this next week. John bore witness about him and cried out, This is he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. And so John looks at them and says, Look, there, this one that's coming is before me. He's eternal in nature. He, is, he has been forever and ever. And, he, and I, he's coming after me, but really he existed way before me. And finally, in John chapter 1, 29 through 31, he says this, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him. And see, remember this. John had great swelling crowds of people that would come to him. The people loved John. They were going to him to be baptized and to repent. And so he was, a, he was, a, he was a, a very successful guy. He was a very successful man. But he listened to this. He saw Jesus coming toward him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John points at him. He says, Look. You take a look at him. This is the one who takes away the sin of the world. After me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came, baptize him with water that he might be revealed to Israel. If you get a chance to read through the Gospels, there's some things about John. He was a, he was a preacher, but he was tough. I mean, if, when the Pharisees would come to be baptized, he would look at them and say, you brood of vipers. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You bunch of snakes. Who told you to flee? And so he was a tough, tough hombre. So he's a very interesting guy. Very interesting guy. But he's also the one that said, he, Jesus, must increase and I must decrease. And so John knew his purpose. The messenger was there to present Jesus to the people. That's why he came. And he was there, sent there so that all might believe in the one who is to come. The king is coming. Prepare your hearts. Get ready. The king is coming. That all may believe in him. So this is about Jesus. But what makes Jesus so great? Well, first of all, Jesus is the true light. And everyone else pales in comparison to him. As good as John was... And he was a mighty prophet indeed. He was not the light. 
And John says that in his gospel. You know, this idea about Jesus being the light comes up an awful lot in the New Testament. But to understand what this means, you have to understand why we need light. You know, according to Scripture, and I, in this, and I think it was the Ephesians that you read this morning, you know, spoke about that we were children of wrath just as the other. The picture that, that Scripture paints of us before we come to faith in Jesus is that we are lost in darkness. And when you're lost in darkness, the first thing you want is a light. Now, I work on the water a lot at night, and there are times at night when the ocean is black. There may be cloud cover, uh, but the moon phases out. It's not even a new moon yet. I mean, it's, and it's dark. And, and going offshore at night, when you can't see the waves coming, that is, I mean, that gets your attention because you just don't see them until they're already there because the white doesn't show up on the tops. That's a dark night. And so living in darkness like this is, is something that, that we know about. And we want light when it's like that. In fact, everything always looks better in the light. On a bad day going to sea, I always like it when it's light because I can see what I'm doing. I mean, that's always a good thing. So light's what we need. But the Scripture says that we were eternally lost. Okay, we're eternally lost. And God sent Jesus to be our light. You know, John was impressive. But Jesus is impressive. You know, we live in a moment of, uh, where influencers, social media, are very popular and powerful. But no one, not even if they have a quadrillion followers, ever will meet the glory of Jesus. He is glorious above all. He is the light that changes the darkness. What else? Well, secondly, Jesus is the one who created the world. And so there's no brokenness that he can't fix. Um, have you ever had something brand new that you had, to, as soon as you got it, it was broken, you had to send it back to the manufacturer to get fixed? Have you ever had to do that? It happens all the time. In fact, I am convinced that now they don't make anything that's supposed to last more than two weeks. They want you to buy it again in about two weeks. They say, no, it's, it's broken. Go on. You know, the world is broken, and it is lost and it is full of darkness, and it is, so, it is full of sin, and it is full of hurt, and it is full of pain. And God acknowledges this brokenness, not just so you can send something back for him to fix it. He sends the creator himself. He sends the creator Jesus back to his creation to fix it. Who better to fix the brokenness of this world than the one who created all things? He is the one who can fix all things. Now comparing that to John, John, again, was very cool. He, he, he wore a camel hair coat with a belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. I mean, yeah, the dude was rocking. He had a camel hair coat on, it, and he was, the, I mean, he was out in the wilderness. He was not in the city. He was in the wilderness. And people flocked to him. And people will flock to Jesus. Yet it says the world did not know him. His own people did not receive him. So what does this mean then? It means that Jesus, the hope of the world, fixing the darkness and brokenness, was rejected. He was despised and rejected of men. You go to Isaiah 53. It's a great passage. It speaks of, the, of what Christ went through, but it says, you know, he was a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, and the people hid their faces from him. He was rejected. Everything that's in the world that was dark, he, want, he came to fix. Everything that was broken, he came to fix. But the world was not looking for a humble king who would give his life. The world was looking for a king who was mighty and powerful and who was going to restore the fortunes of Israel. That's what they were looking for. They were looking for a mighty king. And they wanted a warrior king, not a one who would come in on a donkey and give his life. You see, Jesus never checks all the cultural boxes that we have in place for him. All the things that we're looking for, these cultural things that we want Jesus to do. In fact, in many ways, people want to change who Jesus is. They really do. 
They think that they can make him more appealing to the masses. The answer is not so much to change Jesus, but to see ourselves as needing change. We're not supposed to change who he is because we can't. What we need to do is see ourselves where we are. You have to understand that you are lost in darkness. You have to understand that. And you have to understand that you need redemption. And he's the only one that can give it to you. But here's the best news of our passage this morning. Listen to this. But to all who did receive him. You see, Jesus was rejected by his own people. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them right to become children of God. Who were born not of the blood, nor the will of man, or the flesh, but of God. And so John says, to those who do receive him, you have become children of God. Not just a better version of yourself. You become a child of God. Now, we can get a little bit too comfortable with this idea of being children of God. Years ago, uh, I knew a guy who was, uh, he was a politician in the area around Moorhead City and in Newport. And when it, it, I always asked him to pray and give an invocation at some of the meetings. And he would always start his prayer off like this. He would say, oh God, you are our God and we are your children. And I would think, the heck you say? There is no way, because he, his life did not reflect any of that. It did not reflect faith at all. But see, in his mind, everybody's a child of God. And so sometimes we hold on to this very... When we kind of say, yeah, we're all children of God. Adoption really wasn't on the table for them, and it really was not on the table for us. We were on the outside. We are Gentiles. We're outside of the covenant community. And so we have been adopted in. We have been made children of God. God has brought us near. And the good thing about this is it's not something that you and I have to hold on to. It's not something that I do or you do in your daily walk that keeps you as a child of God. Because it's all according to His will. Friends, that's the best news you're ever going to get. The best news is that you're a child of God and you don't have to do it on your own. In fact, you can't do it on your own. And so, you know, John says, look, he's the light. He fixes darkness. He, you are his and you're a child of God because of him. And you don't have to work yourself to death trying to do this. He's already done it for you. Now, be careful with this because some people get very proud about this station they have in their life. I am a child of God. Sometimes there's arrogance and pride that, that creeps in. And I think that's why John kind of couches it the way that he does. But just understand this. Room for pride and arrogance are removed far from us when we understand that our acceptance into the family of God begins with faith in Jesus. That's what gets us into the family of God. But it's, and it's not a result of our heritage. We were not divinely born into it. It's not because of our own desire. We never desired this. And we never worked ourselves good enough to be accepted as a child of God. We never did this. Why? That's why John says, you're not born of the will of the flesh, the will of man, but you're born of God. It is God's doing. All that we have in Christ Jesus is God's doing. Psalm 118.23 says it this way, This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And so rejoice in the fact that you are a child of God this morning. If you're a follower of Jesus, that is you. And it is not your doing. It is the Lord's doing. And it's marvelous in our eyes. So what do we do with this? This good news. Well, how do we apply this good news to us? Well, first of all, you have to do the same thing that John did. John always pointed to Jesus. Remember that. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Don't behold John the Baptist. Don't behold me. You look at the one who takes away sin. You look at him. We should always be pointing to him. He bore witness to the light. We are to bear witness to the light. And it should be a reflection of our lives. What we say, how we act, how we move around people should always be pointing to Jesus and not desiring the praise of men yourself. And Jesus deserves that. 
He deserved it then, and he deserves it now. And so like John, we are to be witnesses to tell everyone to turn to Jesus. We are to be like John who says, he must increase, I must decrease. How, many, how hard do you think that really is? You are a man who has people following you. They're flocking to John in the wilderness. They are coming in droves to the point where when, when the people started following Jesus, his, John's disciple says, look, look, they're going after him. And he says, he must increase, I must decrease. That's a very hard thing for a man to do. We want to hold on to everything. It's hard. We have to be the same way. Like John, we want to see people find Jesus. We want people to know who Jesus is. And I'm not talking about just here, okay? Head knowledge is good. It's good to have knowledge. Biblical knowledge is good. Theology is good. But we're talking about here. We're talking about in your heart. Do you really believe in who he is? Are you, are you falling before him as, you know, uh, C.S. Lewis said, fall on your face before him? And call him Lord and God. Are you doing that? Because, because see, everywhere that John went, the religious people needed to know. this. They needed to know that their religion could not save them. Your church attendance cannot save you. And so we need to make sure that people understand that it's not us we proclaim. It's not frontline North Carolina we proclaim. It's Jesus we proclaim. We make, we make much out of him. Because he's the one who can take darkness and turn it into light. So as we close this morning, just a few more things. First of all, if you're not yet a follower of Jesus this morning, if you're here, and there may be someone here this morning who does not know Jesus, say a couple things to you. Stop wasting your time and being impressed with people only to be disappointed by them, because they will disappoint. At some point, I will disappoint you. Behold Jesus. Look at him, the light who came into the world, the creator God, the eternal one, who is from everlasting to everlasting. You look to him. He is the creator of all things. He holds all things together. If Jesus were to take his hands off of creation, it would disappear. He holds all things together. All your darkness and brokenness in your life, He can fix. He can save you out of brokenness and heartache and disappointment and pain and all those things. He can fix that. And just don't learn facts about Him. Believe in Him. Cast your hopes on Him. You know, Scripture says that by believing in His name, you will have some things. You will have hope and you have forgiveness, and you will have peace with God. Those things are promises that God says, you believe in my son, you will finally have hope. You believe in my son, you will have forgiveness. You believe in my son, you will have peace with me. And if you are here this morning, and you are a follower of Jesus, uh, we need to take time to really rejoice in the fact that we are children of God. That becomes old hat at times. Sometimes we don't care too much about that. We have more pressing things on, to do. But I think this morning it calls us to remember that, that God in his grace has reached down and he has called us into himself and we are his children. And so rejoice in that. Let me pray for us and then we'll have communion, okay? Father, we thank you for John. We thank you for his ministry as the one who went before Jesus. But Father, we thank you more for Jesus, for he is the radiance of your glory and the exact, exact representation of, his, of your nature. And he upholds all things by the power of his hand. We thank you for salvation, which is in him. We thank you, Father God, that we are your children, not based on our heritage, not based on our works, not based on anything but your divine will. And so, Lord, help us to worship well. Help us to honor you well in our heart and our lives. I lift up this church. I lift up just their, their, their pastors, Lord God. I pray for direction. I pray for strength. We rejoice in who you are. And I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.